in the last video, we found series representations for functions, but only functions that can be related back to 1 over 1 minus x. In this video, we're going to find the series representation for any function. As long as that function is differentiable, this is called Taylor series. What we're going to do on the first couple slides is derive the formulas for Taylor series. Then we'll go through a number of examples. And finally, we'll close out the video with Maclaurin series, but it's just a Taylor series that's centered at x equals 0. But that's the rough idea for today. The main topic for this video is Taylor series representations of functions. We'll see that special cases of Taylor series give us linear and quadratic approximations. What we're going to do is start with a random function and a random series representation, where these coefficients, cn, are currently unknown. We're going to do a little computation, and we're going to be able to get a formula for the cn's for any function f of x. We start by taking the derivative on both sides of the equation here. The n comes down in front, and the power reduces to n minus 1 for the series representation of f prime. Notice here that the terms of the series for f prime, if n starts at 0, the first term is 0 because there's an n right here. Therefore, it seems reasonable to start our summation at n equals 1 instead of n equals 0. Looking at the terms of the sum for the f prime, plugging in n equals 1, we get c1. Plugging in n equals 2, we get 2c2 x minus x naught, etc. And here's where the trick comes in. Notice that if we set x equal to x naught, a lot of these terms go away. This one is equal to 0, and that one is equal to 0, and then we're just left with c1. So plugging x naught into the series representation for f prime is equal to just c1, because the other terms are 0. Continuing with this method, we're going to take the second derivative. Again, notice that if n starts at 1, 1 minus 1 for the first term, the first term of the series is 0. So it would make more sense if we just started the summation at n equals 2, starting at the first non-zero term of the summation. Again, looking at the individual terms of this series, let's just start plugging in some numbers. Notice that if the x value was equal to x naught, then most of these terms would cancel out, and we would only be left with 2 times 1 times c2. Doing this again, taking the third derivative, writing out the terms here, we can see that the third derivative with x naught plugged in for the x value gives us 3 times 2 times c3. Do you see a pattern here? The nth derivative with x naught plugged in will be equal to n factorial. See, this is 3 factorial, 2 factorial, and here there's an implicit 1 factorial. n factorial times cn. So therefore, the cn's must be equal to the nth derivative with x naught plugged in divided by n factorial. Those are the coefficients of the Taylor series for any random function. So here's a summary of our results. Looking at the individual terms here, f of x naught for the first term f prime of x naught times x minus x naught to the 1 power, f double prime divided by 2 factorial times x minus x naught squared, f triple prime of x naught divided by 3 factorial times x minus x naught cubed, etc., etc. Notice that the first two terms of the Taylor series, if you really remember your calculus 1, hey, that's the equation of the tangent line. That is also called the linearization of the function at x naught. We can also include the the first three terms, and that would be called the quadratic approximation. Let's look at an example. We're going to find the linear approximation to 1 over square root of x at x equals 4. What does that even mean? Well, on the graph of 1 over square root of x at x equals 4, we're going to find the equation of the tangent line. That's what the linear approximation is. The linearization function is f of x naught plus f prime of x naught times x minus x naught. Notice that our x not value is x equals 4. So in order to figure out what these numbers are going to be, we just use our function, take the first derivative, and then plug in 4, and we get that f of 4 is a half, and f prime of 4 is minus 1 16. So there we go. That's our linearization. This is the equation of this tangent line to the function 1 over square root of x at x equals 4. Now, why are we doing this? What is it used for? The height of the function is approximately equal to the height of the tangent line, as long as the x values are very close to 4, because that is the point of contact. As long as you're very close to the point of contact, right, not over here, not over there, but very close to the point of contact, the height of the function is approximately equal to the height of the tangent line. So what we have is that the function 1 over square root of x is approximately equal 
to this very nice simple function of a half minus 1 16th x minus 4. So if we wanted to estimate a value such as 1 over the square root of 4.04, .04, as long as the x value is very, very close to 4, we can use the equation of the tangent line instead of using the original function. So 1 over the square root of 4.04 .04 is approximately equal to the equation of the tangent line with 4.04 .04 plugged in for the x value. In other words, we can easily just compute these numbers by hand for 1 over the square root of 4.04. .04. That's approximately equal to 0.4975. All right, let's do a quadratic approximation. Here we're looking at 2 cosine of 4 Remember that in order to figure out the period of the cosine function, we essentially want to figure out when is 4x equal to 2 pi, and you get pi over 2. So one cycle is at pi over 2. We're finding the quadratic approximation at x equals pi over 4. So you can see it in the picture here, at x equals pi over 4, we're going to find a parabola that is pretty close to the cosine function. We're going to find the equation of this parabola. The equation of the tangent line being very straight is, you know, kind of a good approximation. But the quadratic approximation, as you can see, is getting a little bit closer to the function. Our quadratic approximation with x naught equals pi over 4 is equal to this formula, which is essentially the first three terms of the Taylor series. So in order to calculate these numbers, we simply need to compute the first two derivatives and then plug in x equals pi over 4. Now we can use these numbers that we found for the coefficients here. One of them ends up being zero. It's amazing that if you look at the picture, this actually looks pretty accurate. The quadratic approximation would be, looks like an x squared, but it's shifted pi over 4 to the right and then shifted down two units. Oh, this actually looks really similar to the picture that I drew. Our answer is corresponding to our intuitive little picture here. So our point of contact on the previous slide was x equals pi over 4. As long as I have a value that's pretty close to x over equals pi over 4, then the cosine function on the previous slide is approximately the same value as the quadratic approximation formula. So in order to estimate the 2 cosine 4x at x equals 0.2 pi, instead of plugging it into the cosine function here, we can just plug it into the quadratic approximation, and we get our quadratic approximation at the end here. So in other words, at x equals 0.2 times pi, the height of the 2 cosine 4x function is approximately equal to negative 1.605. Now let's do an example where we find the full Taylor series for a function at at x equals 3. We can draw a little picture here. We've got the 1 over x squared function and at x equals 3. Now the full Taylor series, it's not a tangent line. It's also not a quadratic approximation, which remember is like closer than the tangent line. The full Taylor series has an infinite number of extra terms added on here. So the full Taylor series will be exactly equal to the function as long as the x values are pretty close to the x equals 3. And the Taylor series formula that we derived on the first slide is the nth derivative at x equals 3 divided by n factorial times x minus 3 to the n power. Now what we're going to do is actually figure out what these coefficients are more concretely. Because using our function, we can take the derivative and find a pattern. So we've got first derivative, second derivative, third derivative. Notice that every time I take the derivative, I'm not actually multiplying. 2 times 3, and I'm not actually multiplying 2 times 3 times 4, because I'm trying to find a pattern that I can put into a formula, you can start to see the pattern here. Here we have 4 factorial. This is 3 factorial. That's 2 factorial. So let's see what happens when we plug in x equals 3. We've also got the denominators where, because we're plugging in x equals 3, we get 3 squared, 3 cubed, 3 to the fourth. That's a pretty clear pattern that we can put into a formulaic version of these coefficients. Also notice that the signs are alternating between plus minus plus minus. So let's put everything together into a grand formula for the nth derivative at x equals 3. 
Now we have to make sure this works out correctly here. When no derivatives are taken, when n is equal to zero, the term is positive. For the first derivative, when n is equal to one, the term is negative. And similarly, if the second derivative term is positive, that corresponds to n equals two, and negative one squared is positive. So it looks like this formula of negative one to the n is correctly representing the plus and minus on each term. If you're taking the third derivative, you have four factorial in the numerator. Second derivative, you have three factorial. First derivative, you have two factorial. So if you're taking the nth derivative, you have n plus one factorial. And finally, checking out the denominators, the third derivative has three to the fifth. The second derivative, three to the fourth. First derivative, three cubed. So as a pattern, the nth derivative will have three to the n plus two. So here it is. Our pattern is plugged in for the nth derivative with three plugged in. Now we still have the rest of the Taylor series formula here. So we're adding in the n factorial and the x minus three to the n power. Notice we can do is a little simplifying here because n plus one factorial is equal to n plus one times n factorial, so the n factorials cancel. So that's our final answer for the Taylor series. By the way, if you do an exercise similar to the previous video, if you try to find the radius of convergence of this Taylor series, go ahead and do the ratio test, what you will find is that the radius of convergence of this final box here, the final Taylor series, the radius is three. So it looks like this Taylor series is valid from zero to six. That would be the interval of convergence for the Taylor series is zero to six. Let's move on to the final topic, which is Maclaurin series. Sounds like a pretty fancy word, but don't worry. It's just a Taylor series that is centered at zero. We're just gonna set these x naughts equal to zero in order to get a Maclaurin series. So there we go, that's our formula for the Maclaurin series. You have the nth derivative with zero plugged in, divided by n factorial as the coefficients of the terms of the series. Now we can go ahead and derive Maclaurin series for many different functions. It's a lot of work, and you should try some of these and see if you can generate these formulas by yourself. Let's just think about this e to the x formula for a moment. Then all of the derivatives would also be e to the x, and then you plug in x equals zero, and you get e to the zero. So for the e to the x function, this numerator up here is always equal to just one. So you can immediately see that the formulas in the previous slide are directly derived from this box. What we're gonna do is use this list of Maclaurin series as given to us, and we'll use it in order to derive Maclaurin series for more complicated functions. We're going to find the Maclaurin series for e to the negative x squared, and we'll address part b in just a minute. We know that the Maclaurin series for e to the x is the summation of x to the n over n factorial. That's just from the previous slide from provided formulas. Okay, so I'm looking for e to the minus x squared. So it looks like everywhere I see an x, I'm gonna replace it with negative x squared. And we can do a little simplifying here. There we go, that's the Maclaurin series for e to the negative x squared. Now part B is helping us to understand why we even want series representations for random functions. Notice that you actually cannot do this problem by substitution. Now if there was an extra x down in front, like the derivative of the inside function was out here in front, sure, you could do it by substitution, but e to the minus x squared by itself, you can't do substitution. You can't do trig substitution. You can't do partial fraction decomposition. That doesn't even apply to exponential functions. If you go through the list of all of the techniques that we learned in this class through the whole semester for how to take antiderivatives of functions, e to the negative x squared never came up, right? It's actually impossible to take the antiderivative of e to the negative x squared. Go ahead and try it. You won't be able to figure it out. Now that I have this series representation for e to the negative x squared, I could just take the antiderivative of that series. So there we go. That's the antiderivative of e to the negative x squared. So that's a crucial thing that series in general are used for, is finding antiderivatives of functions that are otherwise very difficult to find the antiderivative of. So I hope you enjoyed this video. We've got a number of topics that we covered, linear approximation, quadratic approximation, full Taylor series expansion, and also Maclaurin series, which are Taylor series centered at zero. I'll see you in class.